Uh, my name is Todd Sevig, and I am the director of the Student Counseling Center uh, called Counseling and Psychological Services, CAPS, here at the Michigan campus, and I'm also one of the co-chairs of this conference. Um, and it's just so wonderful to see you all here. Um, uh, Trish and I were reflecting at lunch. For those of you who don't know, last year at this conference, we were literally in the middle of a snowstorm. So some of us are very appreciative to have 40 degrees and sun outside. So I've been here at UM doing this work for 25 years, and in this short span, I've seen a ton of changes in the landscape. And I'm so grateful for this national community, which is growing, of people who care about and will do something about college student mental health. And we are now bringing a new person into our midst, and we have a wonderful ending to our conference today. Um, our closing keynote speaker embodies one of the principles that we've had for all 13 years of this conference. And at one level, it's being multidisciplinary. Uh, a more accurate phrase for me is, yes, sometimes falling along disciplines, uh, but also roles on campus. All the layers of what it takes to accomplish advancement in student mental health. And when we think about us as individual people, enveloping all the layers of what makes us human. And it is our brain chemistry up here. It's also our experiences as human beings in here. And enveloping the total aspect of what it means to be human and engage with each other and for our purposes around mental health and thinking of students on all of our college and university campuses. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aliyah Crum. Uh, we've had a wonderful chance to talk. Uh, Aliyah is an assistant professor of psychology at Stanford. Uh, her research focuses broadly on what I just said, the notion of let's look at multi-layers of what's going on with us as people. So if you've noticed in your program, some of her uh, research is focusing on subjective mindsets, the lenses through which information is perceived, organized, experienced, interpreted, and frankly, how we make sense of our lives. Uh, as the title implies, the notion of rethinking stress. So sometimes we think this generation, and right now, that's where the stress is all coming from. I had an occasion, just a 10-second story here, I had an occasion just yesterday to talk to someone who was 70, 80 years old. I'm not sure how old she was. But she was a student a long time ago and has been retired many years. And you know what she talked about? She talked about how college was extremely stressful for her. And some of the content is exactly what all of us are dealing with. So if we start from the premise that stress may always be part of us, and one of the panelists this morning talked about stress may be part of the human experience, what are some new cutting-edge ways that we can manage this, experience this, and use this to our advantage? And I think Dr. Crum embodies that. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Um, it is a little colder for me than California, but I guess it's all relative. Um, I, it's just been a real honor to see all the amazing work that you're doing in your respective places and across the country, working on improving the health, the well-being, the vitality of our students. Uh, it's just an incredible, uh, important uh, place for us all to put our heads and work together. Um, so before I begin and tell you a little bit about the research and the ideas that I've been working on, I want to take a moment to have you reflect on a personal level. So I want you to take a few minutes to think about a time in your own life where you've experienced a, you know, a substantial amount of personal or professional growth. 
So a time in your life where you really rose to a new level of being, a new way of understanding the world. So as you think about that for a minute, then I'll ask you a second question. Did that time not invariably involve some stress or some struggle? You know, would that same level of growth or transformation be possible without that level of stress or struggle? You know, some psychologists would argue that true transformative change can't happen without some crisis, stress, or struggle. But even the smallest amounts of changes, moving from the fifth to sixth grade, or getting your, you know, degree in college, necessarily involves some stress or some struggle. So as you think back in your own lives and remember that and sort of look at that perspective, Try to then contrast that with the message, the dominating message around stress today. So everywhere we look, there are signs and there are symbols and there are messages yelling at us, telling us what? Telling us that stress is negative, stress is bad, stress should be avoided. Over the years, stress has been called a growing plague. It's been called an epidemic. The American Institute of Stress, a whole institute devoted to combating the negative effects of stress, links stress to the six leading causes of death. And the World Health Organization has gone as far to say that stress is America's number one health problem. So I was trained as a clinical psychologist, and so I like to take this opportunity to ask you what is a clinical psychologist I'm trained to ask, and that is, in thinking about all of these negative consequences of stress, how does that make you feel? It's interesting, right? More stress in all of our good efforts to warn people about the negative effects of stress. What might we, we be doing but creating more stress? So it led me to kind of question this, you know, is this really true? What type of mindset are these messages creating? And might that mindset be paradoxically increasing those negative effects? So as I found over, now it's been about eight or nine years of researching these questions, I found that there are two fundamentally flawed assumptions on the research on stress. The first is that the effects of stress are only negative. The second is that the goal should be to try to counteract and avoid the negative effects of stress. So I'll try to walk through why these are flawed and what we can do about them uh, in this talk today. So of course, it's not totally flawed, right? So there are some very real, very palpable, very negative possible effects of stress. So we know that stress can cause detriments on performance, it can decrease health, and of course it can affect our well-being, affect depression and other mental illness. But if we took all of the research on stress and we laid it out here on this stage, and we could probably fill this stage <laughs> full of papers, what you would realize is that the literature on stress looks like most bodies of literature, and that is that it's not so clear cut. And in fact, there's a strong and growing body of literature showing and demonstrating that the effects of stress can be exactly the opposite. So in the domain of performance, really fascinating research showing that the body's stress response is not designed to hijack your mind. In fact, it's designed to boost our mind into enhanced functioning. So our brains process at about uh, 20 frames per second. So if I flashed numbers up here on this screen, there'd be a rate at which you couldn't read them anymore. But if we all went to New Zealand, which would be a great place to have this conference next year, and we went bungee jumping, and there was a screen at the bottom of the ravine, what you would find is that we could read those numbers. The same speed, now we can read them. The body's stress response boosts the mind. It increases the speed at which we process information. A lot of times when people are stressed, they say, you know, I had this sense that time was slowing. It's not because time slows, <laughs> obviously, but it's because our, our minds speed up to process what's going on. Larry Cahill's done some really interesting research where he has students doing memory tasks, other cognitive tasks, and what he does is he has people stick their hand in a bucket of ice water. And what he finds is that contrary to expectations, when students have their hand in the bucket of ice water, they actually remember things better. They actually perform better on the cognitive task. And that's directly proportional to the amount of glucocorticoids released in the system. So you might be thinking, OK, well, the stress response momentarily can help boost our mind, but eventually it's going to make us sick. 
right? Well, that's actually not true also. So Alyssa Eppel, Bruce McEwen, and others have discovered this uh, possibility in the body called physiological thriving. So it's what happens when we work out, right? Anybody in here lift weights? You know that in order to build the muscle stronger, you literally have to break the muscle down. The release of catabolic hormones recruits a set of anabolic or growth hormones. And it's that stress that serves to build the body into enhanced strength. This is what vaccinations do. They boost the body into enhanced functioning. So st stress doesn't have to deplete us physiologically. And in fact, it's designed to do the exact opposite, recruit, recruit the physiological growth hormones to improve our strength, our vitality. And then the last area, well-being, you might think, OK, maybe that's short-term or moderate stressors. But the really severe stressors, those are ultimately going to affect our sense of well-being, uh, our mental health, right? And in some cases, that's true. But there's also a strong and growing body of literature showing that in some cases, even the most severe traumas in the military and domestic abuse, sometimes some people have the exact opposite effect, where they experience an increased depth of connection, an increased sense of purpose in life, an increased sense of meaning, not in spite of that stressor, but actually because of it. So I present this research not to try to argue or persuade you that the effects of stress are only enhancing and not debilitating, but basically just to point out that the true nature of stress is not so simple. And in fact, it's quite paradoxical. So of course, the question that one asks is then, given this paradox of stress, what is the distinguishing factor? So this is not a new question. And some of you are thinking, oh, we already know all this, right? Isn't the stress, uh, what does the distinguishing factor, the amount of stress? So I've seen this. Yerkes Dodson curve many times in this conference today. Um, and to some degree, it's true that the amount of stress, so the chronicity, the severity, the frequency of stress, is what determines when it's enhancing or debilitating. What's the problem with this, though? If you're over here, sometimes you don't have the ability or the luxury <laughs> to reduce the amount of stress we're faced. We would like to say, oh, I, you know, I think I only want to take two final exams instead of four this semester. That would help me get back to my optimal level of functioning. We don't have that luxury, right? And paradoxically, sometimes trying to reduce the amount of stress that we're faced with actually increases stress. So if it's, you know, the week before your exams or the week before your taxes are due and you think, oh, I'm really feeling stressed, I think I'll go out and have a couple beers maybe get a massage, <laughs> whatever it is, that might decrease stress momentarily, but increase stress over the long haul. <laughs> so we don't have the luxury, or we have counterindicated effects when we try to reduce stress. So then we think, OK, well, maybe it's not just about reducing stress, but what we need to do is teach people how to gain the right psychological, social, physiological resources so that we can manage that stress. We can stay at a high level without having the effects uh, for longer. Has anybody in here ever been stressed out about getting their exercise in, or eating the right foods, or seeing their therapist? <laughs> These are all great things, but oftentimes they just add to the to-do list in our lives, therefore increasing more stress. So what I'm going to suggest is that a third curve is possible, that we can literally bifurcate this inverted U curve, and we can create a new curve in our lives. And in fact, if you think about those times in your own life where you did grow, you did learn, you did reach a new state of existing, this is what happened. You hit that sort of tipping point of self-destruction. There was some struggle. There was some stress. And then something help happened to help you reach a new curve, a new place where you could withstand higher levels of demand, challenge, stress, struggle without the negative effects. So what is it that allows us to bifurcate this curve? Well, what I'm going to argue is that that is quite simple, actually. It starts by just a simple shift in mindset. So what is a mindset? Well, at any given moment, the amount of potential information to take in is unwieldy. So we need simplifying systems or lenses through which to view and make sense 
of the world. This term has been perpetuated by Carol Dweck in the domain of uh, ability and performance, showing that if we can change our mindset about intelligence from viewing it as something that's fixed, unchangeable, to viewing it as something that's malleable, that just that simple shift in mindset in the theory of how intelligence work produces a cascade of changes. So she's found that students who can shift their mindset have a greater appreciation for academics, they're more motivated to do well, and they have improved performance after failure and setbacks. So what we look at in our research is this same idea, um, I'm gonna skip this, but in the context of stress. So if we can get people to shift their mindset, we can honor that it's paradoxical, but move their mindset from a stress is debilitating point of view to a stress is enhancing point of view, that that might have enhancing effects. So how do we measure this? Well, we designed a self-report measure. This is with my colleague, Peter Salovey at Yale. Um, he's now the, the president of Yale, so we're trying to get him to employ this with all of his students. Uh, <laughs> He's busy now, as you might imagine. Um, but this is a measure we designed to assess people's mindsets about stress. So it's really quite simple. It asks questions like, experiencing stress fa facilitates my learning and growth. Experiencing stress enhances my performance and productivity. And then items which are re reverse scored, like experiencing stress deteriorates my performance and productivity. So we take the mean of these items, and we can find that if somebody's mindset rests on this continuum, so we've tested this in a variety of different samples. For example, the Federal Reserve uh, employees there tend to have a 1.9. So they're on this stress is debilitating side of the scale. Uh, UBS average, so these are employees that we worked with at UBS Bank. This was during the financial recession. They were undergoing about a 10% layoff in their jobs. That's not funny. Um, it was quite stressful. Uh, they have a 1.6. And perhaps quite shocking, when we did this with Columbia University undergraduates, what we found was that they had an even more debilitating mindset about stress. More so than the Federal Reserve, which I think is quite concerning about the future. So, here they, so these are their mindsets, but does, how do they matter? Do they produce any changes in people's lives when they experience stress? So to first test this, we measured people's mindsets, and then we brought them, uh, they're actually undergoing a class on personality psychology. And about three quarters of the way through the semester, we said, you know, today we're going to have um, our class on charisma. And in order to teach you about charisma, we're going to bring in a guest lecturer from the business school. This was done at, at Yale. So, uh, guest lecturer came from the School of Management, and she said, you know, in order to really learn about charisma, you need to experience it, you need to engage in it. So what I'm going to do is randomly, I'm going to give you five minutes to prepare a speech, and then I'm going to randomly draw five of you out of this hat to come up here and give your speech to your peers, and your peers are going to rate you on these five dimensions of charisma. And don't worry, you know, if you don't get chosen, you'll have an opportunity to do this in the School of Management where you'll get feedback. And these video cameras in the back, those are just so we can, you know, go back and really code for how charismatic you really were. <laughs> Meanwhile, we were testing their uh, cortisol levels. So I said this. So we were looking at how they responded to this stress. So as you probably know, cortisol is a glucocorticoid. It's secreted during stress. So what did we find? Well, if you, if you think about people in your own lives uh, who have stress, you can sort of put them into two different camps. There are some people that are hyper-reactors to stress. So those are the people who kind of over-engage. You can see them right there in class going, oh my god, I need to think about this. I need to really engage and figure out what I'm going to do and blah, blah, blah. And then there are people who are hypo-reactors. So these are the people that are like, eh, it's fine. I, I'm not so worried about it. And they kind of check out in these stressful situations. So what we do is we separate the sample between the people who had real hyperreactivity to stress and people who have hypo-reactivity to stress. And what we found was quite interesting. So people who were these low cortisol responders who didn't have a lot of reactivity, when they had a stress as enhancing mindset, they actually demonstrated boosted cortisol. So they were more engaged in the task. 
On the other hand, the people who were the high cortisol responders, when they had a stress-enhancing mindset, they showed mitigated cortisol response. So again, it looked like have, being in the stress-enhancing mindset brought people to a state in which they could adequately engage, but not be so engaged that they couldn't focus on the task at hand. We also asked, you know, what's your desire to receive feedback? How excited are you about receiving your peers' ratings of your charisma? How likely are you to join us at the School of Management to engage in another opportunity to test you know, your uh, levels of charisma? And what we found was really interesting here, and that is that people who have a stress-enhancing mindset were more willing to seek out this opportunity to grow, even though it was probably going to be stressful for them. So this was sort of the first test that we looked at, but you can see it all makes sense when you think about why these mindsets would matter. So if you believe that the effects of stress are de deteriorating or debilitating, that of course changes your motivation. You're motivated to either avoid or perseverate. And it also changes your arousal correspondingly. You're either checking out or you're hyper-reactive. But if we just shift the mindset, that whole cascade changes. Now the motivation is not to avoid or perseverate, it's to meet the underlying demand, to approach the stress, to utilize the stress. And that, of course, changes your arousal, which we know changes health and well-being. So in this study, they were just, you know, this was a self-report questionnaire. You might be asking, so can we change stress mindset? Can we get people who have this debilitating view and shift them over to view stress as enhancing? So to do that, we worked with this group of participants, these were the employees at UBS Bank, and we split them into three conditions. A condition we would attempt to elicit a stress as enhancing mindset, a condition that we would attempt to elicit a stress as debilitating mindset, and a control condition. And how we did that was really quite simple. We created these multimedia film clips that presented true research anecdotes um, and facts about stress, but were oriented towards one or the other of these viewpoints. So I'm going to show you these videos uh, simultaneously, but keep in mind they only saw one or the other depending on the condition they were in. right? You know, like just two totally different windows, lenses, through which to view true and factual research and options or possibilities uh, that occur when we experience stress. So our question was, what would just priming these different mindsets do to people in terms of their health and their well-being, their, perfor their performance? So as I mentioned, we had these three conditions, the people in the stresses, and they all, the enhancing and debilitating conditions watched three videos about the nature of stress oriented towards one of these mindsets, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in the morning before the bell rang to begin their day. And we measured them on a variety of things. We measured them on their mindset. We measured them on their symptoms related to anxiety, so headaches, backaches, insomnia, muscle tension. 
And then we also measured them on their work performance, so soft skills and also hard skills like accuracy, engagement, new ideas, etc. So what happened? Well, people changed their mindsets quite readily. So those who watched the stress is enhancing videos reported a more enhancing mindset about stress. Those who watched the debilitating mindset reported a more debilitating mindset about stress. And the control group didn't change at all. More interestingly, those who saw the enhancing videos reported a decrease in these negative uh, symptoms around stress. And they also reported increases in their work performance. So this was just after a week of work, uh, of work watching these simple uh, three, minute, three minute video clips. So that's great. You know, as a researcher, I think, oh, fantastic, we can publish this. But not so practical, right? Because here we are, we're manipulating people's mindset by showing them biased film clips. We can't exactly do that in the real world. I mean, we do all the time. But it's not as useful as if we could give people the complete nature, be straight up with them. Say, hey, you know, we don't really know. There are all sorts of possibilities that occur from stress. But there are two ways you can look at this. And it seems as though taking a stress is enhancing mindset can have self-fulfilling effects. Might you want to choose that mindset? So this was our question that we engaged in to create a training or an intervention uh, that would you know, be more disseminable. So this was essentially the training. So it was, uh, the original training was a two-hour live training where we talked about, just as I did with you today, the nature of stress. We also talked about the power of mindset. So I do, I do work on mindset more broadly, how our beliefs about food change our physiological response to food, how the placebo effect in medicine is a robust and consistent demonstration of how the belief that we are going to be healed recruits healing properties in the body. And so we talked about this idea that our beliefs can have self-fulfilling effects. And then we walked them through a, a three-step process to choose a stress is enhancing mindset. So the steps were really quite simple. The first one was instead of denying stress, pretending it's not there, can you acknowledge stress? Can you simply state, I am feeling stressed? This is really hard. You know, I'm at Stanford now, and I, I hadn't heard this term before, but they say uh, there's a duck syndrome which happens at, at Stanford in which uh, the students on the surface try to present to everybody like they're just totally calm and everything's fine and everything's cool and everything's great, but under the surface, they're really fluttering, <laughs> struggling to stay afloat. Having come from the East Coast, I know that we have the exact opposite problem, <laughs> which is to tell everybody how crazy things are all the time. Uh, so somewhere in the middle. But the acknowledging stress isn't the venting and complaining, nor is it the denying. It's the saying straight up, I am stressed, this is why I'm stressed, and these are my typical reactions to it. The second step was instead of trying to avoid the stress, trying to you know, move yourself away from it, it was quite dramatically different, and that was to welcome the stress. So why do we welcome the stress in our lives? It's quite simple. We don't get stressed about things we don't care about. So if I told you Johnny was failing school, it wouldn't necessarily stress you out. Unless, of course, Johnny was your son, or your student, or somebody you cared about, right? So we have stress in our lives because it's part and parcel with our desire to grow, our desire to achieve the things in our life, or maintain the things in the, our lives that we value, that we care about. So when we try to avoid the stress, what we're often doing is distancing us, ourselves from our values, from our goals, from a sense of meaning. The third step is once we get people to realize that, to sort of approach and welcome the stress, then the task is how do you not spend your time, money, effort, and energy trying to counteract the stress response, but to utilize the stress response? So to be able to channel the increased energy, the narrowed focus, to be able to see the opportunities inherent in the stress. This doesn't mean seeing the stressor as a positive thing but to view the experience of being in the midst of stress as potentially enhancing. So these are the three steps. Um, if you're interested in them, I've written uh, papers on them. We can talk at greater length, but that's just sort of a bit of an overview. 
So what we did with the original UBS group was we then re-randomized them into a training condition and into a waitlist control. So the training condition um, got the training right away, so this two-hour live training. And the waitlist control got the same training, but it wasn't until the after the second set of measures. So what did we find here? Well, once again, their mindsets changed. So now, knowing the truth about stress, they still chose to adopt a stress-enhancing mindset. And again, that was accompanied by significant reductions in the negative health symptoms they were experiencing and increases in work performance. This was after four weeks, but we followed them up six and eight weeks later, and these differences maintained. So this was with UBS bank employees. You're probably asking, what about students? How does this affect students? Well, we recently ran an intervention with uh, 60 students at MIT. These were uh, students undergoing their uh, interphase program. So they're underrepresented minority students. And they come to MIT to get to know each other and get to get some pre-work in classes before um, the full-blown semester begins. So we worked with 60 of these students, and we split them into two conditions. Uh, one condition got the stress mindset training that I just described to you. The other condition got a traditional stress management training. So this is what you typically see in stress management, which is telling people to avoid stress through time management, prioritization, uh, telling people to reduce stress through deep breathing, and then helping them counteract stress by engaging in exercise and other healthy behaviors. These are all good things, uh, don't get me wrong, but oftentimes they're presented to people through this mindset of stress is bad, you need to do these in order to reduce it. So we, what did we find? Well, this was uh, six months following the training. So the original training was in July, and we followed them up in November. And what we found was that their perceived levels of stress were no different from one another. So both the people in the stress management training and in the stress mindset training were experiencing a, the same amount of stress. Uh, however, the participants in the stress management training were reported more positive coping, so planning, reframing, uh, in, uh, finding instrumental support, finding emotional support. So ironically, even though we were telling the people in the stress management training to seek out these active coping, they weren't doing it as much as those who shifted their mindsets. More importantly, uh, what we found was there is a huge increase in the positive affect that those in the stress management training were experiencing. There was no differences in negative affect. So they were all still you know, experiencing the highs and lows. Um, but they had more of those lows accompanied with positive emotions. And we've been finding this in a lot of our lab studies, too, you know, where we stress people out with the Trier stressor uh, speaking task. They don't get any less stress. They're still angry that they have to go through this, and they're still kind of frustrated about it. But they have a sense of confidence. They have a sense of hope. They have a sense of meaning during that. And so ironically, you know, the trying to reduce stress might not be our best approach, but can we encase that in a sense of meaning, positivity, uh, uh, approach orientation? And then lastly, we found that those who were in the stress mindset training had many more healthy days. So this is the Center for Disease Control's healthy days measure. This is a Z-score, uh, which essentially shows that most of the people in the stress mindset training were above average in terms of the healthy days they were experiencing, uh, whereas those in the stress management training were below average. So it's interesting, right? Before we saw that the training was effective, but now we're showing that it's significantly more effective than the traditional approach that we've been uh, trying to produce for so long. So I'm not showing, sharing all of the research with you today. We've done quite a bit. but. Again, now our theoretical model is growing. So instead of just changing motivation and changing physiology, what we're finding is that these mindsets change uh, affect, and they change attention. And all of these things together can produce cascading effects on our health, our well-being, and our, our uh, performance. So this is the more appropriate one to view. Uh, so if you believe that stress can be enhancing, if you think stress is an inherent, natural part of the human condition, that simply going through it
can help me grow, become more strong, become more connected, uh, then several things change. As I mentioned before, you're motivated to utilize it. You have optimal levels of arousal. We've also seen a boosted DHEAS response, so this is that growth-promoting hormone. Uh, your attention changes. So on cognitive tasks, we find that students are more biased towards happy faces than they are towards the threatening faces. So they're seeking out the positive aspects in their lives. And as I mentioned, no reduction in negative affect, but there's this boost of positive affect. And all of these things we know can improve our health and our well-being. Oh, and most interestingly here, it, the effects that we can produce when we're in this mindset are self-fulfilling, but they're also reinforcing. So what, in essence, we're doing is we're creating a change in mindset which affects outcomes, which then serves to reinforce the mindset. So we're creating a virtuous spiral in people's lives that ironically is fueled by stress. So I want to mention a few clarifications here. Um, I don't know if you can see this quote, but it says, or this uh, cartoon. And so without further ado, here's the author of Mind Over Matter, and he's walking into a poll. Sometimes I find like I'm, you know, I'm in that guy's shoes. Uh, it's not about denying the potentially negative effects of stress. So as I mentioned here, there are very real, very true, very palpable negative effects of stress. This is not about denying that that's possible. It's also not about thinking that the stressor is necessarily a good thing. So flunking an exam or breaking up a relationship or a death in the family, those aren't good things. Those aren't positive things. But the experience of going through them can produce enhancing outcomes in our lives. And lastly, it's not about seeking out unnecessary stress. Uh, so I'm not suggesting in your counseling centers you recommend that your students put their hands in a bucket of ice water when they're studying for an exam. However, what it is about is recognizing and honoring the paradox of stress. And most importantly, it's about recognizing the power of our mindsets in that. So what are we feeling? What are we thinking in the midst of this stress? You know, as I mentioned this morning, when you think back in the times in your own lives where you grew, where you learned, it necessarily involves some stress. Now the challenge is, can we do that more often in our lives? And can we help our family members and our students find that shift in their curve of functioning in the midst of challenging times. In essence, we're helping to learn pe help people to learn to stress better. So I want to end with a brief story. So this happened to me when I was about halfway through my PhD program, and I was really struggling at the time. You know, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in research or you know, go more into practice. I was shifting advisors. I was changing relationships. I was, you know, had a lot going on. And I remember I had, I had Friday morning meetings with my advisor at 8 a.m. And it was Thursday night. It was late at night. And I was running some analyses, uh, some statistical analyses in the computer room in the basement of the psychology department at Yale. Now, if you've ever been in this building, if you've ever been in the basement of the building, it's very dark. It's very cement. It's not exactly the most inviting place. Uh, and here I was, I was fearing, you know, furiously working away at this, anxious about this meeting, overwhelmed about all the work I had to do, uncertain about my value uh, in the program I was in. And I heard the door <laughs> creak open, which kind of freaked me out because it was so late at night. And my friend Brett, who was the IT guy at, in the psychology department, happened to be there. Um, who knows what he was doing at that hour, but he peeked open the door and he looked in and I was like, hey, Brett, you know, tried to give him the don't talk to me, I'm busy look. And he goes, ah, just a cold, dark night on the side of Everest. I said, okay, Brett, see, you know, I got a lot of work to do here, see you later. It, uh, it wasn't until several weeks later that it hit me. If you were climbing Everest, you could imagine that there would be some nights that were cold, that were dark, that weren't exactly the most pleasurable moments of your lives. 
But what did you expect? Did you expect that climbing Everest would be a walk in the park? No. In fact, climbing Everest wouldn't be so cool if there weren't so cold, dark nights on the side of Everest. What was I thinking? Did I expect that getting my PhD would be a walk in the park? Did you expect that raising children would be a walk in the park? Did you expect that finding that perfect person in your lives <laughs> would be a walk in the park? No. And perhaps so much of the greatness of all of those things comes not because we walk through them easily, but because of the inherent stress, because of the struggle, because of the things we grapple with on those cold, dark nights on the side of Everest. So this really dramatically changed me. As you can see, it actually influenced what I did my PhD on, which was on stress. Um, but I hope that this work at least resonates with you to some level. There's a lot more that we need to do. We've, you know, the original training was a live intervention. Uh, we've now designed a multimedia intervention that has several different modules. We've been testing this out in several different samples. We're working with a sample of nurses at IU Health, we've worked with Navy SEALs, we're doing some other um, collegiate samples. Um, but there's a lot more work we need to do. We need to see the long-term effects. We need to see, you know, how is this affecting physiology? Uh, we haven't yet worked with clinical samples. So for people who are severely depressed, is this useful? So I hope that, you know, you will be encouraged to think about the mindsets that you're generating on your own campuses and how you might be able to shift them to be more positive, more proactive. Uh, so with that, I'll thank you for allowing me to share our work and thank you for all the incredible work that you do. Mm -hmm. We have about 10 minutes, I'm told, for questions, so I'm happy to, to have a discussion. We just solved the world's problems. Everything's great. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll see you later. I know it's been a long, a long conference. You're anxious to get home. Uh, yeah, so please use the mic because I think they are recording this. So we'll start here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I uh, wanted to ask you a little to say a little bit more about mindset, maybe a, um, uh, with different cultural variables like gender and race, ethnicity, if, if you have any information about that. Yeah, no, that's a really great question, and we're just starting to explore it now. Um, so we haven't seen dramatic differences in our samples uh, in terms of gender or race, um, but most of those samples have been, you know, uh, in the U.S. collegiate, you know, so we haven't looked at sort of international samples, and I might imagine that there's differences in sort of more Western versus Eastern views on this. And to be honest, we've only looked at, if we've like glossed over that, we haven't really dove down to see how, you know, what are the differences there at a more nuanced level, but I think that's really something important that we need to do. Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned that you're, you're careful to kind of qualify that you're not trying to say that certain stressors should be regarded as good things. But I could see maybe when you deliver the intervention that some people kind of take it too simplistically, then, mm -hmm. then maybe they, they slip into embracing kind of bad things in their life, like maybe a bad relationship or not getting enough sleep. And have you found ways to kind of correct people if they take it in kind of the wrong direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's critical. So I think it's paradoxical, right? I think that actually when people welcome stress in their lives and take the opportunity to acknowledge, you know, I'm really anxious in this relationship. Um, can I welcome that? Well, why do you welcome it? Because there's something in there that you care about. It's because I care about um, my well-being. I care about being able to express myself in my relationship. I care about enjoying life, uh, embracing the challenges with somebody. When they start to recognize what it is that they really care about in that relationship and focus on that instead of the stressor, what we found is people are actually more likely to disengage if it's not working. 
Um, so we, we need to do more, you know, more work around making sure that that link gets made in the trainings. Um, so what does it mean to utilize stress? It doesn't mean to just soak it in and you know, experience it. Sometimes it means, okay, maybe I'll take this moment in which I'm totally overwhelmed and not okay to change some things around, to maybe get out of the relationship or pick you know, one fewer extracurricular. Or, you know, but it's driven not, the, the key difference is it's driven not from an attempt to avoid the stress, but from a, oh, I care about well-being, work-life balance, energy, you know, sleep, and then they make those choices. So that's where we're headed, um, but making sure that that's in there and people capture that is important. Yeah, over here. Uh, have you developed any analogous training paradigms for placebo effects? Ooh, we're working on that right now. So my colleague, Ted Kapchuk, uh, who directs the programs for placebo studies at Harvard, uh, so most people think that placebos uh, won't work if you know it's a placebo, right? So if you're told, you know, you have anxiety, here's a medication, but actually it's a placebo, that it won't work. And what he's found is that that's not true. So they've designed open-label placebo studies, so they've done this with migraines, um, anxiety medications, and irritable bowel syndrome. They bring people in, they say, we're going to give you this, you know, this, uh, thing of pills here. We want you to take them every day. It's important that you take them every day. We also want you to know that these have no active ingredients in them. They are a placebo. They do nothing. But we know that in your condition, placebo effects work. <laughs> and what they find is that in these open-label trials, people get healthier. Their irritable bowel syndromes decrease. Their migraines go away. They have less pain. It's fascinating, right? So Ted and I argue, he thinks it's about the symbol of taking a pill, but I think what he's done is quite powerful, which has shifted the belief or the expectation in the drug to the belief that the mind can cure. And I think if we can do that <laughs> in our, with our children, with ourselves, that m many wonderful things can happen. We need to figure out how to harness it and do it better. So if you have ideas, let's chat after. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for your talk. That was it's great. It's really interesting data and, and story um, and fits really well with mindfulness research, which is also something I'm really interested in. Um, I'm wondering a little bit about um, how mindset influences behavioral response to stress mm -hmm. and if you're finding that some of the positive outcomes of those situations, health outcomes, work performance outcomes, may be due to when you have this better mindset, you choose reactions to stress that are going to lead to a better outcome. And so it's not just the mindset itself, it's your behavioral reaction and how that might translate to students who are feeling overwhelmed or stressed and then choose, instead of to go out drinking, to do something productive like make a list or prioritize or talk to their professor rather than wallow in stress. Yeah, definitely. So I think the answer is both. The answer is we've seen in the research and the science that shifts in mindset can have an immediate and direct effect on our physiology. So even in that moment, you know, before an exam or during the exam, the shift in mindset can change the, the hormones <laughs> that you're experiencing during stress. Um, but I think to create the most optimal results, uh, when we have the most optimal results, it's, it's through um, both direct effects on physiology and through changes in behavior. And so we, um, you know, we saw with the MIT students that they did exactly what you're suggesting, which is they coped with it better, they engaged with it more, they sought out support, they planned ahead, right? Um, and, and so I do think a lot of that is going on, but I also think that the mindset shift changes things directly as well. Mm -hmm. John Graydon, University of Michigan, first, thank you. It's, uh, Truly, you know, these are the kinds of thinkings that we need out of the box, and you're doing it. Um, an observation first, just on a comment you made just a few minutes ago, and then a question. The observation is just all of us need to think out of the box on a word that gets imprinted with us. So there's a lot of research right now that shows that the placebo response, when you really look at certain things, for example, Many, most perhaps, are associated with changes in mu opioids that are being secreted in the brain. And we don't 
think that way. I mean, well, gee, this doesn't have an active ingredient that comes from a pharmaceutical company of which we're aware. That doesn't mean it's not doing anything. And what you're doing is you're observing that and probably picking up on some of it. That's just a sidebar. The question is, what strategies do you have in place for following some of the participants long term and then translating these into actually some clinical studies that might even have long term because that's really what would be the, the payoff. The follow-up is the great provider of truth. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Um, yeah, anybody who's interested in the placebo research should go on the Harvard program in placebo studies. There's amazing neuropsych work showing that you know, it's not just that change is your subjective uh, state, but we have bio neurochemicals that get secreted when we're on a placebo, and they're different. If you're on a pain placebo, it's, you know, it triggers opiates. If you're on an anti-anxiety placebo, it triggers you know, parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous response. Um, but so the long-term question, yes. Yeah, so we, we're figuring that out now, and honestly, I think this is a good opportunity to, for people to think you know, in their clinics themselves how we might do this. Um, with the MIT students, for example, this is a system that they have in place that tracks uh, these underrepresented minorities not just through the four years, but through their lives. Um, and my colleague, Madupe Akinola, who I did this with, her husband was one of them. <laughs> and he had his, you know, 30-year reunion with them. So that's one way we're going to be able to follow up with them. So these 40 students were our initial run. We're hoping to be able to do this year after year after year and then be able to, to track them. We have a, um, in the spring, we're doing an experience sampling method where we'll be able to get their stress, their affect, et cetera, during final exam period, and also track that against their exam scores. Uh, that's, that's terrific. I just can't sit down when I'm hearing that because I would love to see something evolve from this. There's a study that's been underway here, Sri John Sen, where thinking, how does he study stress, and looking at cortisol and actually measuring hair cortisol, because mm. then you can get it over time, ended up actually saying, where do you find stress that's kind of built in and maybe you can't do too much about it, and decided to look at medical interns, huh. baseline, and then starting their internship and following them through. The number has now reached 7,000, and they're following them over time, what you just said, longitudinally, looking at it almost like the Framingham model and how one looks at these people for 25 years and they're sort of agreeing, I'm going to give you a card afterwards and you guys ought to talk. And then he could have some samples of that group and try a mindset modification approach. And some of it could be put into a follow-up paradigm and it might, might give us some cool information. Yes, please but do. That's, that's fantastic. These are the types of partnerships we want to create. And the real question is not just, you know, does this last over time, but how and why does it? You know, so when are the times that we elicit this virtuous positive spiral? And also, you know, when are times that people learn this information and then they experience their first stressor and they're like, oh, that's hogwash, you know, and go right back to a stress is debilitating mindset. So once we're able to get those longer term samples, we can understand what triggers that positive spiral and what we can do to enhance that. So thank you. It'll just a question, do you have any plans to study this on um, patients that have experienced severe trauma, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder type patients, and where do you, do you think that there might be um, differences in the results, or have you studied it at all? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. I, so, as I mentioned, I was trained in clinical psychology. I did my internship at the Veterans Hospital in West Haven. Um, so I only have anecdotal experience of working with um, veterans who had post-traumatic stress. And so we did a lot of this work. And in my experience, they found it to be very valuable. That said, I, I think that there's a lot we can do there, but I think we get more bang for our buck when we focus on prevention. So that's why now I'm working with the Navy on how do we train, um, you know, the... the these, they're, the, the sailors, I couldn't think of the, the, the soldiers, the sailors, how do we change their mindset before going on deployment? 
um, in order to prevent some of these very long lasting consequences. So they right now go into battle with two options. You're either going to come back normal or you're going to come back with PTSD. So putting out a third option is huge, right? So we're doing a lot of that preventative work. That said, I, I do think that there's a potential to work in, in clinical settings. Um, so again, another opportunity for partnership. My colleague Crystal Park does a lot of that work at uh, Connecticut. So thank you again. Those were great questions. And feel free to email us if you have any other questions or ideas for collaboration. Send me your thoughts. Thank you. We have one last minute question. One last question. <laughs> patients for suicide prevention, like on a suicide prevention hotline. Hmm. Um, changing mindset in, in an urgent situation is really critical. And I'm wondering if any of your research, uh, have you thought about how your research might be applicable in those situations? Yeah. The beauty of mindset is that you can change it in just the flip of a switch. Um, <laughs> how you do that in a crisis call, we would need to sit down and talk about. But it can happen, it's very possible. And I think that that's what does change in people that we save is, is a shift in mindset and not much else, yeah. So thank you again, Dr. Mm -hmm. Crum. <laughs> so we're now at the close of our 13th annual conference. Uh, on behalf of John Graydon and Daniel Eisenberg uh, uh, and myself as co-chairs and really the whole planning committee, uh, we've hope, we hope we've been good hosts to you all, uh, we would just like to say thank you for coming, for participating, for engaging, and ultimately for contributing. Uh, we do really want to say, and have, I'd like to have all of us say thank you to one person. So a lot of people actually go in to making these two days work for us, uh, but one person in particular uh, really does take the lead with organizing all of this machinery, and it's Trish Meyer, and I think she is in the back there, so let's thank her. <clears throat> so one other thought, maybe most importantly, I'm not sure. As all of us leave and arrive back home, whether it's 100 feet away here on campus or uh, on either ends of the country, um, Please use. You know, John said something way cool today at lunch. Uh, brought up the concept of voice. And so as we leave and go home and go back to our homes, please use the concept of voice. Use your voice, your literal voice, your conceptual voice, your written voice, your loud voice, your angry voice, your compassionate voice your quiet voice, your voice filled with tears of sadness if a loved one is going through a mental illness or a mental health issue, your voice of joys, your voice which was once silenced and now flourishes, a voice filled with wisdom, use that voice. And if at times you don't have the energy to even have a voice, find, find someone who does and join together. Let's use our professional training voices. Let's use our voices as consumers of mental health services, our voices as faculty, as staff, and as students on all of our campuses. Because the larger collective needs them all, and in fact, is defined by all of our voices working together. So thank you and safe travels home.